Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's Select Science webinar entitled Focus on the Key Players, Surveying the Proteome with High Density Antibody Panels. My name is Carrie Haslam and I'll be moderating today's presentation. Today, I'm delighted to be joined with Dr. Valerie Sloan-Jones, Director of Marketing and Technical Support at Ray Biotech, as she explores how high-density antibody arrays are used to answer critical questions about diagnosis, molecular pathology, and drug resistance. After the presentation, we'll move on to our question and answer session. Please feel free to ask any questions for the Q&A session at any time during the webinar. You can submit your question at the left of your screen. So without further delay, I would like to hand over to our speaker for today's presentation, and I would like to thank her for presenting with us today. Please go ahead. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so my name is Valerie Jones, and uh, I am the Director of Marketing and Technical Support at Ray Biotech. And today I would like to talk with you about uh, surveying the proteome with high-density antibody panels. So we'll get right to the point. Uh, the majority of cellular activities are mediated by proteins. And not only that, but the majority of therapeutic targets are actually also proteins. So this means that the proteome not only reflects current cellular activity, meaning that cellular activity is dynamic and can change under different circumstances or disease states, um, but also is relevant to disease diagnosis, uh, disease prognosis, and assessing drug response. Um, also, the proteome uh, may reveal signatures or molecular mechanisms of drugs or of the disease itself. And also, it is modestly to poorly correlated with the transcriptome. So the question is, how do we study the proteome or even get a glimpse of it? Uh, so generally, large-scale parallel protein detection can be achieved uh, by two major methods, um, and that would be antibody arrays and mass spectrometry. So let's go ahead and compare the two head-to-head -head, uh, as a means of discovery. Um, so first we can talk about the size of the screen that you can do. Uh, now, both methods can detect thousands of proteins simultaneously, um, but it wasn't too long ago, actually, that that wasn't the case for antibody arrays. It used to be only maybe hundreds of proteins that were able to be detected simultaneously uh, by an antibody array. Um, and that's the reason. The reason for that is because uh, the number of analytes you can pick up is limited, of course, by the number of high quality validated antibodies that you have available to you. Um, whereas mass spec does not have that limitation. But um, after years of uh, painstaking research and development efforts at Ray Biotech, um, uh, array technology is uh, our core technology, and uh, we've been at it for over 20 years now. Um, arrays are actually starting to catch up in terms of the uh, density and uh, the number of analytes that can be simultaneously detected. So at this point, it's uh, up to 6,000, um, as of 2022, uh, proteins that can be detected by our largest array. Now, regarding sensitivity, um, with antibodies, of course, sensitivity can vary, as everybody knows. Uh, but a good antibody can detect down to you know, low picogram per mil concentration ranges uh, quantitatively, um, perhaps even lower than that in some cases. Um, whereas with mass spec, uh, nanogram per mil levels of protein is more typical. Um, and, and getting lower than that sensitivity-wise normally requires sample enrichment or depletion. And then finally, there is the practical matter of instrumentation costs. Um, mass spectrometers uh, are pretty expensive. They, can, they start at 60K and can go quite a bit up from there. And also, the person running the instrument needs to be highly trained, so that's another investment there. Um, running an array has a, a quicker learning curve. Um, it's pretty much very similar to running an ELISA, so pretty easy to do. Um, and the price range for the equipment is 
bit more accessible for a, a moderately funded lab. So your options could include various different systems, such as your like hemiluminescent detector, like you would use for a Western blot, to your laser microarray scanner, um, and your flow cytometers, which you would use for cytometric bead assays. And these types of scanners uh, read fluorescent signal. Um, those also can vary in price, though, and they can get a bit expensive, too. So um, the takeaway message here is like that really, first of all, mass spec is a hypothesis free approach, um, making no assumptions as to which proteins will be of interest. Uh, and so this uh, can actually widen your scope of discovery. Um, whereas while antibody arrays are limited by the number of available antibodies, uh, the antibody panels can actually be designed uh, ahead of time to target disease-specific and clinically relevant proteins, including those proteins that are of low abundance. In other words, too low abundance in some cases to be detected by mass spectrometry. And by the way, if you're interested in learning more about uh, antibody arrays versus mass spectrometry, we've got a great blog post that compares and contrasts the two in detail, which I will link right here. Um, so if you would like to read that, feel free to uh, copy that link or take a picture of it. So since I'll be focusing mainly on planar antibody arrays in this talk, I'll explain a little bit about how they work. Now, many antibody arrays um, on the market today utilize the sandwich immunoassay method. Um, many people are familiar with. In this case, you've got a panel of antibodies, each immobilized in a discrete location on a planar solid support, such as a glass chip or an hydrocellulose membrane. So then you can add your complex biological sample. Um, no purification or enrichment or depletion is needed. You can just put the sample straight onto the array, and the target proteins will then be captured at their specified location. And then cocktail of paired detection antibodies is added to the array that binds to the, capture protein, the captured protein at a uh, non-overlapping epitope. So that antibody is conjugated to biotin, which allows uh, streptavidin conjugated detection molecule to be added. Um, that could be HRP or a fluorescent dye. And then from there, the signals can be detected using uh, chemiluminescent or fluorescent detection. So this procedure requires um, pretty little hands-on time, and you can get a full result within usually a day. Now, just as a quick side note, um, the sandwich method is used in several of our array product lines, namely uh, the Quantibody and Rayplex arrays, which are quantitative, and then the C-series and G-series arrays, which are semi-quantitative uh, platforms. Okay, so the other method of detection um, is called the, the direct labeling method. Um, so this is the one that's a little bit different. In this case, you're going to start out by labeling the sample first with biotin, and that's actually a pretty easy step to do. Um, you can use the reagents and spin columns provided in the kit. The whole process takes maybe an hour. And then you can add that sample to the array um, as before. And then your proteins will be captured. Um, and because they're already labeled with biotin, you can obtain a signal directly without the use of a second antibody. So um, you have added one step, but also eliminated one. So it takes about the same amount of time. Um, and incidentally, our product line that uses the label-based method is called the L-series array, L for label. Okay, so a few practical notes about array solid supports. Like I mentioned before, uh, antibodies can be printed on a variety of surfaces, and a popular one is nitrocellulose uh, because people tend to be really comfortable handling nitrocellulose membranes. Uh, it's exactly the same as processing a Western blot minus the gel and transfer, of course. Um, but one thing to note is that chemiluminescent detection is amenable to semi-quantitative readout, okay, meaning that you're measuring fold changes in signal intensity as opposed to calibrating the signal to report a concentration of the analyte. So that would be quantitative output. Um, Membrane-based arrays are always uh, semi-quantitative. 
Now, um, glass, on the other hand, has a few unique advantages. Um, the glass slide is a miniaturized format, essentially, that allows for a lot smaller antibody spots to be printed in a smaller area. So that means that a smaller amount of sample volume will be required to work the array. So um, you'll see here, I've noted the working sample volume um, at the bottom of the slide. So 100 microliters is required in a typical glass slide array, uh, as opposed to 1,000 microliters that you would typically need with a membrane array. So um, that's a pretty big advantage in terms of sample consumption. Um, and then one other advantage with glass slide arrays is that they are precise enough to be quantitative if needed. Um, but really, both formats have the ability to be scaled up to really large panels of up to 6,000 antibodies. All you need uh, is more surface area. And then finally, you have your uh, cytometric bead arrays, um, which uh, consist of each antibody being coupled to its own bead. And probably a lot of you are familiar with these. Um, and while you can't achieve those high-density panels with uh, cytometric bead assays, at least not at this time, um, these assays are really popular and a very familiar technique with excellent precision that doesn't require a dedicated instrument. At least Ray Biotex doesn't. Um, these assays work with uh, just about any flow cytometer. And then a few quick notes regarding uh, compatible sample matrices. So while, you know, serum, plasma, urine, cell culture, supernatants, and lysates are definitely the most commonly tested sample types with antibody arrays, there are numerous publications with other less common specimens with great success. Um, those include uh, tears, synovial fluid, uh, dried blood spots, uh, bone extracts, uh, gingival fluids, laser capture, microdissected tissue, uh, believe it or not, has been used successfully. So basically, almost any biological specimen that can be solubilized into an aqueous matrix can likely be used on an antibody array. Okay, so let's go over a few published examples of high-density arrays uh, that are kind of helping to answer some important questions. And in this case, uh, we are looking at therapeutic mechanism of virotherapy for breast cancer. Now, this study came out in 2018 in Cancer Letters, and uh, the problem presented here was that brain metastatic cells um, as a result of breast cancer are difficult to treat and resistant to virotherapy, aka gene therapy. So, they asked the question, can a conditionally replicative adenovirus be engineered to enhance oncolytic potential? So here's what they constructed. This type of adenovirus has been engineered with a couple of notable characteristics. Uh, first of all, it selectively replicates in cancer cells rather than normal cells, okay? And that's by virtue of a Delta 24 E1A mutation along with an altered CD46 receptor. Um, this construct is also oncolytic, meaning that it kills cancer cells once it enters them. Um, and then another thing is that this uh, conditionally replicative adenovirus, or CRAD, can express a therapeutic gene of choice. So in this case, the tumor suppressor gene KISS1 was selected. Um, so therefore, in this study, the ADKISS1 genotype is referred to as the armed phenotype, uh, whereas the one without it is called unarmed, or it's the, it's the control. Um and then also, it's not shown in the diagram here, but I should note that uh, the genome also contains a fluorescent reporter protein called mCherry. So basically, in summary, this crab that they designed uh, not only kills cancer cells, but also acts as a vector, delivering a tumor suppressor protein to the cell. And so basically, these two effects are supposed to enhance each other. And so what they found is that the ADKISS1 definitely does uh, kill metastatic brain cells more efficiently. And furthermore, it's not toxic to normal fibroblasts. And uh, it seems to do this through enhancement of apoptosis. And uh, just in case these are hard to read, um, the black and blue and red bars here indicate increasing MOI. 
and uh, the cells that are used in the assay are listed there at the bottom left, and uh, the tests that were used uh, are uh, a viability test, um, calcinian AM, and then MTT is a proliferation assay, and then of course caspase uh, measures apoptosis. So I'll give you a second to look at that. So the next thing they did was to collect the cell culture medium from infected brain cancer cells and subjected that medium to an antibody array analysis. And specifically, they used a thousand target quantitative panel known as the Quantibody Kiloplex from Rebiotech. And so the network diagram shown here presents the proteins upregulated in the armed adenovirus relative to the control adenovirus. And what's interesting here is the downregulation of this VEGF node, this one that contains uh, clusterin, thrombospondin 1, GFAP, um, those function in stress response and cell regeneration, growth, and attachment. So from here, they concluded that KISS-1-mediated signaling is involved in cancer angiogenesis and potentially in shaping the immunological compartment of the brain metastatic environment. And then after further analysis of the array data using Go and CAG database, uh, they observed that uh, KISS-1 overexpression upregulates MAP kinase, uh, RAS, and RAP1 signaling, and downregulates proteins associated with cell adhesion, angiogenesis, proliferation, lysosome activity, and cytokine-cytokine interactions. So they concluded here that ectopic expression of KISS-1 in breast cancer-derived metastatic brain cells serves to uh, inhibit proliferation, decrease cell viability, and could potentially suppress tumor angiogenesis. Um, and also that this approach uh, may have potential as an anti-cancer treatment in conjunction with oncolytic virotherapy of breast cancer. Okay, so let's now talk about an example of how array-based proteomics was used to shed light on mechanisms of drug resistance. So this study here um, was published in Nature a few years ago, and it was primarily concerned with uh, BRAF mutant melanomas. Um, but the authors noted that many cancers have a tendency to develop resistance to chemotherapy, um, especially targeted drugs. And so they proposed that the tumor microenvironment and specifically stromal cells uh, may confer resistance to therapy rather than the cancer cells themselves. So they sought to try to demonstrate a molecular basis to inform more, in, more effective therapies. So in this study, in order to look at the interactions between the tumor cells, the stromal cells, and the drugs, they actually created a co-culture experiment with where they co-cultured 45 different GFP-labeled cancer cell lines with 23 different stromal cell lines in the presence of 35 different cancer drugs. And so it was basically a huge number of co-cultures, basically in a matrix. And from that data, they identified that 16 out of those 35 drugs were rendered ineffective in the presence of stromal cells. And furthermore, that these stromal cells were particularly effective on the target drugs as opposed to the cytotoxic agents. Okay, so that's shown in this graph down here um, where it's showing that proliferation is more robust and more often occurring in the presence of oncoprotein targeted drugs. So then they asked the question, um, is the stromal cell rescue of the cancer cells mediated by direct cell-cell contact, or is there a soluble factor that is causing that to happen? So what they uh, found here is that the preconditioned medium from stromal uh, fibroblasts was indeed sufficient to keep melanoma cells alive in the presence of a RAF inhibitor. So the question is, what is in that preconditioned medium? Um, there is a soluble factor in there, but what is it? So they used a, a large 567-target uh, label-based array to uh, find out an answer to that question. 
And uh, they observed that HGF, or a hepatocyte growth factor, uh, was most commonly associated with drug resistance in various different stromal cell lines. Um, so you can see that in the right-hand figure. And it also so happens that HGF activates MET, which is a kinase receptor that is overexpressed in melanomas. So to determine whether or not HGF expression could cause resist could could cause the resistance rather than simply being the result of it, um, they treated melanoma cells with recombinant HGF and determined that indeed it was both necessary and sufficient to confer resistance to two different targeted drugs. Um, and this effect could also be abrogated with neutralizing antibodies or a MET inhibitor. And then furthermore, they determined that uh, melanoma uh, cell proliferation is uh, actually dose responsive to HGF in the presence of drugs, and that the MET inhibitor reverses drug resistance in the HGF secreting cells. So these were some pretty interesting results, and it led them to conclude that uh, the Ray Bio label based array was able to identify HGF, which is a crucial drug resistance factor. Um, these findings support the clinical relevance of HGF-mediated resistance to BRAF inhibitors. And uh, they also suggested from this data that combination therapy with MET and RAF inhibitors could be more effective for BRAF mutant melanomas than the treatment alone. Okay, so in this... Uh, Next and final example, um, I'd like to talk about how high-density arrays were used to determine personalized treatment. Now, um, this study has started off with a single case report of inflammatory eye disease and sought to answer the question, can the vitreous humor protein profile reveal a personalized treatment to correct vision loss? So uh, this this patient uh, that they did the study on, who is referred to as patient nine here, basically presented with poor vision, um, possibly indicative of posterior uveitis, but otherwise this patient was healthy and all of her standard tests uh, for posterior uveitis came out negative actually. So she was initially diagnosed with idiopathic posterior uveitis. And so since they really didn't have a therapeutic protocol for this, uh, they decided to look at the cytokine profile of her vitreous fluid biopsy and compare it to some other uveitis cases to try and find a correlation and define her disease more precisely. So in this study, they collected uh, vitreous fluid from five healthy controls and 15 patients with posterior uveitis. Um, now, the patients had different kinds of uveitis, for example, three with idiopathic, two with intermediate uveitis, and so on. Um, and they analyzed 200 microliters of fluid from each patient using the Quantibody Human Cytokine Array 4000, which is an array that detects 200 cytokines. So um, after doing an unbiased cluster analysis, they identified 60 proteins that are differentially expressed in uh, uveitic vitreous. Um, 11 proteins were downregulated and 49 were upregulated. And so that uh, data is expressed here in this heat map. Um, so here uh, are the results of the quantibody array, 4,000. And so on the left there at the top, you can see the, the five controls in green and then the 15 patient samples in red, including patient nine, which is indicated with a red asterisk. So um, the same cytokine expression pattern was detected in the known uveitis patients and in patient nine that had idiopathic posterior uveitis. Now here's what's important here, and here's where the precision medicine aspect uh, comes into play. Patient nine had a profile that was most similar to the two patients with autoimmune retinopathy. Uh, so the heat map here shows the distinct profile shared by these two autoimmune retinopathy patients and patient nine. So that led them to uh, a discovery 
that allowed them to undertake a precision medicine approach, basically. So based on these data, they changed the treatment protocol uh, from uh, previously she was receiving intermittent injections of an immediate release corticosteroid. And they switched her over to surgical implantation of a controlled release device uh, that delivers steroids in a controlled manner. And that actually provided long-term sustained intraocular immunosuppression. And that treatment actually eliminated her retinal edema and improved her visual acuity from 2070 to 2030. So in conclusion, proteomic profiling of vitreous fluid with a 200 marker human cytokine antibody array was used by doctors as a new diagnostic tool for deciding the appropriate therapy, i.e. precision medicine therapy, to save the, U the eyesight of a uveitis patient. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions about the material presented here, feel free to post them here, or you can email me directly at valerie at raybiotech.com. Thank you for that interesting webinar, Valerie. Um, so let's move on to the last part of today's webinar, which is the question and answer session. So the first question we've got is, can high density arrays be used to profile post-translational modifications such as um, phosphorylation, acetylation and so forth? Yeah, uh, so thank you for that good question. Um, and uh, the answer is yes. I didn't get a chance to cover that today in my presentation, but there's a couple of ways you can go about it if you want to answer questions of not just protein expression, but how are the proteins being modified. So um, uh, one way to go about it is by, you know, as I alluded to earlier, using a switch-based method in which you would capture the protein and then detect with an antibody that is, for example, phospho-specific. Okay, so in that case, you would be able to accomplish phosphorylation profiling um, if you have a whole panel of antibody pairs that are phospho-specific. Um, so that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is uh, by a label-based method. So um, if you have uh, perhaps a, a labeling chemistry available to you that is specific for uh, for example, nitrosylation or acetylation, um, and, and then that provides a way of modifying the captured protein, then that would eliminate the need for your detection antibody. Um, and in that way, you would be able to see which proteins are not only captured, but also acetylated. And um, I should also mention, um, if you want to look at glycosylation, if you're interested in that, uh, you can also use lectins, okay, so of course lectins are proteins that, uh, you know, have the property of binding to specific um, sugar groups. Uh, you could also use that as a strategy for identifying not only which proteins are captured, but uh, what sort of sugar signature is on there. So, um, so yes, there, there are ways to modify the array technology to where you are detecting various different kinds of post-translational modifications. And um, so with regard to the phosphorylation and glycosylation, those are actually arrays that Rate Biotech offers. And uh, with regards to other like acetylation and nitrosylation and things like that, um, those are ones that are under development right now at our company. So thank you for that. That's perfect. Thank you, Valerie. Um, so on to the next question. This one is, have your arrays been used to analyze biomaterials such as tissue scaffolds and amniotic membranes? Uh, yeah, so this uh, sounds relevant to the area of regenerative medicine. So um, yes, I've, I have seen uh, many people, many, many research groups looking at um, uh, looking at these types of samples, um, specialized uh, materials used for either either tissue scaffolds um, or materials used for, uh, for example, wound healing. Um, a, a lot of times amniotic membranes are used for this purpose. Um, and so people are frequently interested in seeing what sorts of growth factors are produced by these materials uh, to characterize um, how well 
uh, they can uh, complement the host tissue, um, as well as maybe looking at um, structural proteins that are being produced by these materials, such as collagens um, and extracellular matrix proteins. Um, obviously, MMPs, you know, your metalloproteinases are relevant here as well. So um, I've seen quite a few studies uh, in this field coming out, you know, looking at protein profiling of these materials, and, and quite a few of our customers are interested in detecting extracellular matrix proteins in general. So um, yes, um, so these materials have been used quite a bit in studies, and so um, generally, you know, if it's amniotic membranes, for example, we'll, they'll just treat them like um, just like any other lysate sample. You you know, you would take the material and create an extract from it, and then that usually has the bioactive factors uh, contained in it that you would want to detect. So um, yeah, pretty pretty interesting field. That's a great answer. Thank you, Valerie. On to the next question, and this is, do you know of any studies where both antibiotic arrays with mass spectrometry were used? If so, did the results conflict? Yeah, so uh, I'm assuming uh, that you mean um, where the antibody array and the mass spec technique was used on the same sample. Um, and, you know, actually, no, I haven't seen a lot of studies like that. Um, I think my impression is that studies like that are relatively rare. Um, if, if anyone in the audience knows of one, please, you know, uh, pop it in the chat box or let me know. But uh, I do know of one uh, off the top of my head where uh, actually, this is kind of an older study, but there was one where someone looked at aqueous humor fluid uh, from the eye and was wanting to study the protein profile of it and used both uh, some antibody arrays from our company and then also mass spectrometry and kind of compared the results side by side. And it was interesting because the two sets of proteins detected by the two methods were um, completely different. Uh, you know, out, out of the hundreds of proteins that they found in total, I think maybe only 10 or so from, from what I recall were actually common between the two. So it was, it was kind of interesting because, you know, not that it's that surprising really, uh, because the mass spec method was going to pick up your more abundant proteins, um, like your complement proteins, your IgGs, structural proteins, things like that. Whereas the antibody arrays is more, um, you know, secreted effectors like cytokines and whatnot. Um, so I, th I think it kind of just showed that, uh, you know, the two methods could really be complementary to each other if you want to get a really holistic picture of what the protein profile looks like. But uh, but yeah, I do not think that that is a commonly used um, uh, methodology for analyzing samples, is, is, is kind of using those two techniques in parallel. That's great, thank you. Um, so the next question here is, is there a limit to the number of antibodies that can be included in a array? Uh, so, yeah, that's a good question. It actually uh, depends on if you are using a sandwich-based array versus um, a single antibody label-based array. Uh, so if, if you're using a sandwich-based array, um, and anyone who's familiar with sandwich-based multiplex uh, probably knows this, there, there is definitely a limit to how many you can put in one single panel um, because of the whole issue of um, the detection antibodies potentially interacting or interfering uh, or cross-reacting with other antibodies or other proteins. Because of that issue, you really can't practically put together more than maybe like 100. It's the absolute limit uh, in one panel. Um, after that, it just becomes a tremendous amount of work to cross-test each new antibody pair with everything else in the array. So. Um, so yeah, there is a limit. Now, the way to get over this is, of course, to split up your panel into multiple different panels that are separated um, and then kind of run them in parallel. So you'd basically be splitting your the sample across several arrays to achieve a larger kind of output of targets. But um, the other method, if you're using a label-based type of methodology or antibody array, then, uh, then, then really there's no, there's no cross-reactivity problem. 
And so um, it, it's really, you can make the array as big as you want. I mean, it's real, you're just limited by the amount of surface area that you would want to realistically deal with. So you can make much, much larger panels um, of antibodies using the label-based method. So probably the limit would be, um, it, I, I assume it would be thousands, perhaps 10,000. Um, the largest one we have produced is like a 6,000, like I mentioned. So. That's great. Thank you, Valerie. Well, that's all we've got time for today. So thank you very much to Valerie for that informative discussion and presentation. And thank you to everyone joining us online and for sending in your questions. If you've got any other questions, please feel free to email me at editor at selectscience.net and I'll follow up with your questions. If you would like to listen again to this webinar or invite a friend to listen, it will be available to watch on demand in just a few days time. Goodbye and thank you once again for joining us.